Thanks for listening to this Voice of San Diego podcast bonus episode. I'm Scott Lewis, the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at Voice of San Diego. All right, we are crushing it this week. Some of the biggest races in San Diego, and we have some of the best interviews with the candidates there, and they're in your feed. You can check those out if you haven't yet. Be proud of them. This episode, though, is dedicated to the city attorney's race, and this is to be the top lawyer in the city. Um, The city attorney both prosecutes misdemeanors within the city boundaries and it serves as the kind of corporate attorney for the city, but is, as an elected official, has a very independent position. And for four years, I've been waiting to uh, bring Mara Elliott back into this studio to talk about some of the issues that she's been involved with. I interviewed her in 2015 when she was running for the race, and a lot has changed since then, so I had a lot of questions built up since then. Running against Elliott's well-known local environmental attorney, Corey Briggs. Briggs has sued the city numerous times, on environmental matters, but also public records matters and other issues. Briggs denied our request for an interview. Here is our interview, though, my interview with City Attorney Mara Elliott. Mara Elliott, hello. Good morning. Thanks for coming in. Glad to be here. So last time we talked like this, it was uh, 2015, I believe. A lot has changed since then. How old are your boys? Oh, one is 12 and one just turned 15. Okay, wow. So yeah. that means they they were about the same age my kids are now. So that's a big transition. Yeah, it is. And in, in boys' years, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, let's just jump right in. We have a, a kind of a short period, uh, and I want to make sure I get to a lot of things. So if I if I get a little hasty, that's what that's about. But part of the reason is uh, we haven't had a chance to have you in since that time. And, and I'm curious why that would be. Why, why wouldn't you want to come in? We've asked uh, every year. And and you wouldn't want to come in and speak. And I, I'm just curious why. Well, it's not because I wouldn't want to. I've been really busy Yeah. Um, since I took over, I think about a month after the Chargers left. Yeah. And then there were a couple citizens initiatives. And I've been part of the negotiating team on the sale of SDSU or to SDSU West. We're just busy. And then I'm still raising a couple of kids. So I try to balance everything as best I can. Okay. And do you enjoy it? The job or the kids? The kid. I mean, the job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do. Most of the time. I, I think, um, you know, about 90% of the time. There's always those rough days where you think, oh, my gosh, I want the day to end. But generally, yes. Cool. Well, so I remember around that time, 2015, I remember seeing you uh, outside the city attorney's building. And you were holding a clipboard, collecting signatures. And it was just this, like, perfect image of an earnest civil servant trying to take the next step, you know, and get something done. And and everybody treated you so condescendingly, I think, in the race, yeah. as though you weren't a, a factor. You know, oh, it's adorable. She cares. She's interested. <laughs> but um and and then you 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 won. I'm curious what has changed in that period because uh it seems a lot. What would you say has changed? About me or just about your perspective of the office? Well, I I think it's an eye-opener when you're elected because up to that point, I was just Mara Elliott, a chief deputy city attorney, somebody who had worked in the public sector for about 20 years at that point. And then you get elected, and it's like their relationships change the next day. I thought it was fascinating because we have a big office. There's almost 400 people. And suddenly, you're seen different. I'm going to come in, and I'm actually the boss of everybody. And the key decision maker. So there was that one month transition where I think every it, it felt like a seismic shift in the entire world that I was living in. Like people start sending you cards and n- nice things or talk <laughs> to you differently or how what, what changes? I think a little bit more caution. Okay. I, I think that happens when you get elevated within your, your organization. Hmm. Let's talk specifically about the perspective. So when we talked in 2015, uh, you had a, a a view of the city attorney's role. You really, I think, saw like, hey, I can just run this place better. I think that was basically the essence of your case, mm-hmm. that I can run this place better. And I think that uh, I'm very competent for that. And you actually articulated a role for the city attorney that I found pretty interesting and talked about a lot. And that was almost a lot based on your experience at the county general counsel's office. Uh-huh where the county's general counsel is truly the corporate attorney for the county of San Diego, the agency. And and you you wanted to make the point like the city attorney shouldn't be out front, that that was the model. 
And obviously that's changed a lot. You, you uh, came in, you saw that vacation rentals, uh, you wanted to take a stand on those. Mm -hmm. Those were illegal. You've, um, you've been out front in a number of uh, resolutions you wanted the city to be a part of gun violence, restraining orders. We'll talk about a lot of these things, but a lot, you're, it does seem like you wanted to, after you got in there, be up front and be in the middle of some of the most contentious issues. How, what changed? So I, I would disagree with that. I, don't, I think what changed is you can talk about the job you think you're going to take, and then you experience the job you're going to take. So I, I think um, coming in, I had probably a very innocent perspective of what the job was. And like you said, I came from the county uh, well over 10 years ago, and I've been at the city for about 11 years. And the county has an appointed county council who doesn't prosecute. So that's a key difference. And then the county council is somewhat insulated from the political body mm-hmm. in that he reports to the um, chief administrative officer, not directly to the board. My relationship, whether I wanted it to be or not, is directly with the council. And they're all elected. And then you have an elected mayor. So even if I wanted to try to say, oh, I don't want to be in the front of this issue, I always get pulled into the big issues. That's part of the job. And I don't know that I really saw that that was going to happen. That was an eye-opening experience. So let's just take the Citizens Initiatives, for instance. Um, I didn't want to get involved in that. I, I thought no matter what I did, I would be seen in a bad light. You're talking about the Mission Valley? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, for the stadium. Right. And people are going to have uh, very strong opinions of the stadium and how it should be used. And I don't know that they necessarily want to hear from the city attorney. But with that particular situation, there were some questions about the use of the land. And it was unprecedented for a private developer to come forward and propose taking city land for use. So as a lawyer, I had to insert myself in that. So you get a lot of these. Um, we can, I mean, streetlights is another wonderful example. Yeah. I don't own it. it. It's not my project. Yet every day in the newspaper, it was portrayed as Mara Elliott's streetlights. Right. Now, that's not true. Well, the other, go. if I can just sure. um, add to that, a lot of it was false, like the description of how the streetlights would be used. So I can sit back and say, okay, I'm going to let this play out. I'm going to take a back seat. It's not my issue. Or I can step in and say, let's clarify this. Let's talk about what it really means. Why is it important to public safety? Yeah. So what I'm trying to say to you is sometimes you think you know what the job is, but until you really have the job and you're doing the job, you don't necessarily understand all the ins and outs of it. One of the things you did say that you would stand up about, one of the things you would come out and and really be outspoken for is if you saw the city council or the mayor doing something that violated the law or sure. that was that was inconsistent with the law. Uh-huh. And you did see that. As you mentioned with Mission Valley, um, both of the proposals that were put forward for citizens' initiatives, you had legal concerns about. And in particular with Measure G, which did win, that was, uh, I think, the essence of your legal argument was that the a, a citizen's initiative could not tell an elected leader or mandate, or direct, or or somehow force an mm-hmm. elected leader to act in a certain way, to make certain decisions. Right. They are elected leaders, and they should have that autonomy. You made that, and I thought it was a very articulate and, and provocative point, and yet you didn't follow it up. You it, it passed, and now you, as you say, are part of this negotiation to actually implement it. Uh-huh. Why did you stand down on that? So it's not a matter of standing down. Ultimately, the city council determines when we're going to litigate something. Mm -hmm. Unless I'm acting as a city's prosecutor, then I'm completely independent. So in that case, they they went ahead and they said, okay, we understand your concerns, city attorney. You try to address that before the voters voted. The judges declined to take it up and rule on the merits of it. Interestingly, another case came down that really solidified our, our view of it. But can I say 100% that it was not legal? I cannot say that. Mm -hmm. I had concerns, obviously. But if I could say without a doubt, yeah, it's not legal, then, of course, I wouldn't sign off on it. But that still is, you know, there's a question, and there always will be a question, but there is not an appetite at the council level to pursue that. In fact, everybody's saying, get it done, get it done fast. 
And there was no appetite in your office to make a bigger deal of that, have press conferences, write op-eds, do the kinds of things that might force it to become more of an issue? Well, I, I think there's always that temptation, but I have to think about what is it that my client needs to know? What is it that, that the public needs to know? We put out some reports. We had some public conversations. I thought that was sufficient. We had litigation. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a point where you say, okay, it's pretty clear people want us to let this go. And I thought we got to that point and, and move on. And people are excited about what's happening with the, the old um, Qualcomm Stadium. Do you think it sets a bad precedent that, that um, these kinds of initiatives can you know, sort of set in motion how the city should operate and what land it should, how it should develop everything? Oh, totally. I think that a savvy developer will say, uh, Balboa Park is the crown jewel, the things I could do with it. Let me put something out before the voters and see if we can run with it. And that was one of my biggest concerns, frankly. Mm-hmm. Will you stand up if that happens? Oh, absolutely. I'll have to raise the red flag, but whether it's going to go anywhere, it just depends on the body I have before me. Right. One of the things we wrote about uh, that you have stood up a, a lot on and, mm-hmm. and really made a name for yourself, not only here, but in the state and in the nation, is this uh, effort on, on what are called red flag laws or gun violence protection or gun violence restraining orders. Correct. Uh, and so I think, let me see if I can get the essence of this, is that if somebody is determined to be a threat or has certain uh, criminal experiences, then you can go in and seize their guns. That's correct. So usually when we hear about a mass shooting or some kind of a shooting, people always say there were red flags. And that's where the the terminology comes from. There was something on Facebook or certain statements were made at the workplace or in the neighborhood. So we now can act before a crime occurs. And that's the beauty of the law. Mm -hmm. Is what did you see in that law that others missed? Why did you see an opportunity there? Well, I I think, um, and and this is probably more of a personal thing, and we started out by talking about my kids. I remember dropping them off at school the day I heard the reports on the news about Sandy Hook, and I just felt absolutely devastated by that, and I think every parent feels helpless. Like, what can I do? So as a mom, and, and this is, you know, some time back now, I I started to look at my school safety plan. Mm -hmm. I got involved in the committee. And then you start thinking, my God, this doesn't feel like enough. And every time I dropped my kids off, I got nervous. So that's the mom in me. But when I was running for office, I met with a lot of groups. And you learn. I mean, there's an evolutionary process when you run for office. You know, I started, the way I started my campaign and ended were so different because Mm -hmm. you learn so much. And I heard there was this tool that was being used um, that was enacted after the massacre at UC Santa Barbara where I went to school. So I'm also one of those people that thinks, you know, there's a lot of signs here. Maybe I ought to pay attention. And we looked at it, and I thought, this is actually something we can do at the city level. Because in my mind, it was always, this is a state or a federal issue. It's not a city issue. And fortunately, the police chief at the time saw things the way I did. And she said, often when we send our officers out to to a home, They'll report back that they're scared about what they saw, and they're afraid they're going to have to come back again and address some kind of a violent situation. Mm -hmm. So she saw it more from protecting her employees, her police department. So we worked together and said, let's try this. There is is a chance we will fail, but let's at least give it a shot. And it's been extremely successful. It took off in December of 2017. And just last year, we got 200 gun violence restraining orders. And I guess you can see that as a success, but I also think it's come, it's horrifying. That's a lot of, that's what we knew about. And that's where we were able to insert ourselves and do something about it before something happened. And it, it impacts all walks of life, whether it's like at your employment site or we've seen neighbors who are in, in disputes, uh, schools, uh, which is horrifying. Yeah. Folks who are starting to slip, we work with Alzheimer's San Diego a lot, and they were saying, and I hadn't even associated with our older population who were once responsible, and then through the years they start to slip, and their families don't know what to do about it. It's interesting, the evolution of thought, too, because I think a lot of us think gang violence necessarily involves guns, and you don't put that in that bucket of gun violence prevention, but we were working with Bishop Bowser, and he said, hey, this is a big issue for my community, let me help you. So we have gotten so much um, community support to make sure that this program is effective. And we've gotten a lot of, and this wasn't intentional, just worked out that way. 
Because when I started my program, I, I wanted to steal someone else's. That's the easy thing. But nobody else was doing anything, so we had to create our own program. And with that came a lot of duplication in other jurisdictions. And mm-hmm. we have trained law enforcement agencies throughout the state of California yeah. on how to use these programs effectively. One of the, You made a point there that I wanted to just explore a little bit, which is this idea of, um, you know, we say or there, we often hear law-abiding citizens should have the right to, to bear arms. The problem is, is that we don't know when they're going to not be law-abiding. And yeah. do you think people should have access to these uh, these firearms that are, are so, um, uh, you know, potentially lethal and, and it, I mean, do you, in your essence, in your, in, as you approach public service, do you think these firearms should be available as much as they are? I don't. And I, I'm sure that's going to cause a, a, you know, a point of contention for others. I'm, I'm not trying to monitor what people think they need to keep themselves safe. The only concern I've ever had is making sure that if you have a firearm, you're responsible with it. Because a lot of people, I mean, you might have read about our safe storage of firearms ordinance. It's just another important thing. Just if you have a gun in the house, either have it on your person, have it in your immediate control, or lock it up. And that's all it says. But I I don't see myself as the parent of all San Diegans. I I think we all just have to be responsible. But if you could wave a magic wand, you would have much more severe restrictions on firearms. I, I think... I think that would be true. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, vacation rentals. So you did come out soon after you were elected yes. and say vacation rentals were illegal, that uh, there was no place in the municipal code that defined them, and thus, de facto, they were they were violating the law. Yes. And and then it sort of stopped, and you said, look, I'm, I can't proactively do anything about that because any case about that needs to be referred to my office. I think that was your point. Well, a little bit. I'll have to probably expand on it a bit. And then, and then you said, um, and the council needs to regulate. And, they, and we watched for four years them try and fail several <laughs> times to regulate those. Uh, what made you stand up on that, but then also like not go the full distance to actually like prosecute or somehow bring those into uh, into order? Yeah, so um, this was another issue I heard about on the campaign trail all the time. It yeah. really is just one of those meaty issues that people want to talk about a lot. And I am very sympathetic to that. So um, this has been an issue since 2007 when Kevin Faulkner was a council member. And he had a question for then City Attorney Mike Aguirre and said, can we regulate short-term rentals? And we said, yes, in fact, here's how you can do it. But just be aware that there's coastal commission uh, regulations you would need to follow. You have to be in compliance with that. So I heard repeatedly that we need to do something about this, and I am 100% on board. So the first thing was taking all those old opinions and um, looking at them and trying to give some direct advice. And Barbara Bree in particular said, I need to have a memo from you telling us that these are not legal so I can act. That's what she said. And I also heard that from communities. Give us something. In fact, I remember a meeting where I sat down, sat down with a lot of the community leaders and they said, give us an opinion because we want to, and we want to enforce this civilly. Right. Uh, go to small claims court, whatever they felt that they needed to do, yeah. to do. So I issued that memo back in March. And what it said is we have a permissive land use code. So if it's not specifically allowed in the code, you can't do it. The problem for me has always been that it. So I, I could say to you, Scott Lewis, what is a short-term vacation rental? Can you tell me what a short-term vacation rental is? Uh, a place that is rented out for less than 30 days. Okay. And can you find it in the municipal code? No. Exactly. So out of fairness, you need to have somebody tell you what the meaning is to prosecute. And that's just that's due process of law. Mm-hmm. So we said to them, Tell us what it is and tell us what kind of regulations you want. So do you want to only regulate whole homes? Can you rent out a room in your home? Give us some specificity. And if we can't even define what a short-term rental is, I can't prosecute somebody for having one because they should know what the rules are. And that's fair. And that's what the industry wants to see. That's what people who want to protect their neighborhoods want to see. So So you're saying like it wasn't consistent with the law. It wasn't in the law but you also couldn't act on it without more clarification about what the law is. Exactly. And that's what we have to do as prosecutors. That's the fairness of the justice system. For me to prosecute someone and say, hey, you have a short-term rental. And they're saying, well, I, I didn't know I had one. I just I have my cousin staying here over the summer. 
how can I distinguish whether somebody's just having, you know, relatives from Italy visit or um, their, their cousin needs a place to stay for a couple months while they get hooked up in college? It's really difficult for us to prosecute. So at this point, what I'm left with is what's in the state law or what's in our municipal code, which could be noise or trespass or vandalism or, you know, some of the quality of life issues you have in your neighborhood. And that's just, that's going to be the lowest priority for a police officer, frankly. Yeah. And it's going to be a low priority for the city because we're not increasing code enforcement to address those issues or the same issues. But I'm seeing a renewed appetite right now for the council to pick up the issue again. I know. I'm kind of thinking, do I want to sit through? And and you might recall some of these um, hearings were 12 hours. Yeah. But it's a, it is such an important issue, and it really does matter to a lot of people. You might remember last year when the council rescinded its own ordinance, there was a lot of talk from the days about, we'll be back. We're going to bring something stronger for council to consider. One of the things that we were really, I think, fair to say upset about was this, uh, this issue with public records. We mm-hmm. we offer uh, often deal with public records requests. And then the only way that we have to enforce those against school districts, we've done so many investigations into sexual misconduct among educators. Yes. Uh, and the only way we've been able to get those records often is to sue, is to say, you aren't giving us records we know exist. And then we have to go to court. And then the only recourse that we have to um, you know, force them to do that is the fear that they have that they might have to pay our attorneys for, for having to sort of enforce that law. And you worked with uh, State Senator Ben Wieso on SB 615. You pushed him for it, which, which would have made it very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, seek those attorney's fees, which were the only enforcement mechanism people like us had to get those records. Why did you do that? Yeah, so I see it a little bit different. And in my role, my job is to protect the city. And a big part of that is protecting the money that we have because it's pretty limited. We've identified in at the city that we get sued for things that could have very easily been resolved. So with um, with discovery, you have a meet and confer process. And I've had my own frustrations in trying to get public records. So I can tell you just from experience Sometimes just having someone pick up the phone and talk to you so you can describe what you want makes all the difference. And with our system, you put in a written request, and then whoever receives it is in the position of trying to interpret that. And we get about 5,000 of those a year. I would suspect that it's grown even since we looked at the data. So generally, I think people do their best at the city. And you might see it different. Maybe you haven't always had good results. I had the same conversation with the UT where uh, Chris Reed and Matt Hall were saying, yeah, you know, things go pretty well for the city. It's not so much you guys were worried. It's about some of the other entities we've, we've had trouble with. And I can appreciate what they said, and I can appreciate what you're saying. I was looking at it from our perspective about how do we reduce these disputes and get people records quickly without having to go through, the, through litigation. And I had my own incident where I couldn't get records, and I really thought, do I litigate this or do I let it go? And I continued to poke around until I got somebody who helped me in my particular situation. With the press, I think we're really good at getting you what you want and quickly. But generally for folks, they would be in a position of having to sue. So that's part one. Get it done, get it fast. We could do that better at the city. I, and I have my ideas for it. I think a public information office would be a really great thing for the city mm-hmm. so that we're all working consistently. Because you might be aware that every department has its own uh, PRA staff. And that can lead to a great deal of inconsistency. It can lead to departments um, responding to you in one way or producing in one way. So I think there's certainly room for improvement at the city. But that was my objective on that end. For the litigation part, if the city goofs and it's not intentional, I don't think taxpayers should be on the hook for that. And I, I realize you may see it different. If we do it intentionally, we're playing hide the ball, absolutely we should be held accountable. And that's what that law would have done. So I don't think it eliminated your... How, how would it have done that, though? Other states have actual punitive consequences. So I'm not against changing this as our only mm-hmm. enforcement mechanism. Uh, other states actually have criminal or other sort of punitive ways of enforcing that. If you can prove that they wrongfully are withholding documents, yeah. there are actual consequences. But you only took away the consequences that exist. You didn't actually add any. Um, and I, and and so can, can you see why that would be like 
really scary for us. Well, I, I think that I clarified it. So if it's willful, then yes. If it is unintentional. But proving willfulness is just brutal threshold of, of, of evidence. Something, there has to be a better way to do it. And I remember when we spoke in 2015, we both agreed that there's some flaws in this act. Sure. I don't know. Obviously, I didn't have the right answer. I certainly okay. didn't please too many people. Okay. Um, and, and I heard about it, and I certainly heard your frustrations. And I have to say that it's, I think you always learn lessons, especially when you're new at a job. And we, we could have rolled it out better. I mean, I know that I could have. I should have sat down with reporters and said, "Okay, how can we fix this? What's, would, what is a good solution?" Well, let's let's in this part on that. I would love to sit down and talk about ways in which that law could be changed yeah. to add actual consequences that don't have to be through that same system. But I do have to move on to another issue that you mentioned earlier. This thing with the smart streetlights. Sure. So. This became a, a rather large issue. Your opponent, Corey Briggs, uh, has used it in, in a lot of messages against your reelection campaign. You said the city council should have asked tougher questions about how the city's $30 million loan and program for these smart streetlights was going to be spent. Uh, the UT came back and said there's lots of blame to go around. Goldsmith, uh, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, nine council members. But it's the city attorney's job to read the fine print, not the council's job, mm-hmm. that this idea that the smart streetlights were presented as this way to mitigate traffic and environmental concerns. And then the first benefit we've heard about them is actual law enforcement. And we were denied the chance to have a, a robust public conversation about what law enforcement's role would be with these smart streetlights. And, um, and and you're saying, like, that's the council's fault. Did you not carry any of that blame? No, and I'm not saying it's it's the council's fault. So let's just go back to what happened. The first week that I was actually in office as city attorney, this contract was approved. And in the ordinance that was brought to council, it actually mentions the potential use for these streetlights. I don't think anybody knew they would be used that way because that wasn't the intent. That was not how staff presented it. But in the meantime, the smart streetlight technology was being discussed throughout the nation. In fact, our city was very proud of its ability to use smart technology. And there had been a lead up. There was a pilot program downtown and the capability had been widely discussed. So this all predated me and I was I was running for office. This was not an issue that was really on my radar. It, be, it came on my radar later because Corey Briggs made it a um, campaign issue. In August of 2018, and I've spoken with the chief of police about this, there was an investigation of a crime, and I don't have all the specifics on the crime, but the officer looked up at a street line. He said, that looks like a camera. Do you think that's a camera? So they did some investigation, found out there were cameras on some of the street lights, and only about half of them had it. And they got the data from that and thought, you know, this is a pretty good tool. A couple of months later, they briefed the city council members on the use that they had made of this streetlight technology and also said, we will likely use it for other purposes. And they have. And there's been about 250 cases that have been resolved by use of streetlight technology. About three months later, the police department put on its website a policy about how they were going to use the data. And it didn't get flagged. Nothing happened. That robust discussion that you said that you wish had occurred really didn't happen. It started to happen a little bit last summer when there was um, some discussion about the streetlight technology. The rollout was not great uh, at all. So as city attorney, sitting in that chair that very first week with the information I was aware of, the data was not going to be used for law enforcement purposes. And that happened quite accidental. But now that we're aware of that, I think Absolutely, that robust discussion has to happen, and I know that it's happening right now. It started at PSNLN a couple of weeks ago, and our office will be there 100% to support and write whatever policy it is that they want. But I think one of the biggest challenges I have as city attorney is I've got nine council members, and each of them have very different interests depending on their council district. You know, one can be so different, District 1, from District 9, and their concerns are different. So it's very hard to look at something and try to figure out, if I were District 1, what are all the questions I would want answered? And that's one of the reasons we go to committee. We do briefings before items are heard at council. But it was a $30 million contract. And I'm I'm seeing an alarming amount at city council of, you didn't tell us this was here. 
And there has to be some give and take in the system. Uh, everybody needs to do their role or it just doesn't work. There, there will be holes in the system. I have to count on my client to tell me what it is that interests them and ask those questions so that they know they can make a decision that fits their communities. One of the things that's interesting to us right now as those policies are being preliminarily discussed, as mm-hmm. you mentioned, uh, GE used to be responsible for the whole thing. They've sold the program. And how do we know that that raw data is being protect, protected or isn't being you know, monetized or, or shared in ways that you, you, you assured people that they're, it's being protected? Yes. But how do you know that? Because we have a contract. So we have to monitor the contract. And General Electric, I think it's under GE Current now, they came out to PSNLN and they explained as well how they were going to use the data and the, the ramifications of the contract. So we have already done that. And they have done that. And I think having that robust discussion and really fleshing it out is going to give people some comfort. I think it's always disarming when you find out about it later and weren't part of the the process leading up to it. So there's going to be, um, it's going to take some time to explain the technology to people and get them on board. And and I think we're ready to have that conversation. Do you support uh, citizens' oversight of the effort of uh, that could watch and, and make sure the police were using this appropriately according to the plan that comes uh, out? Well, that's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought about that, but I, I don't see any downside to that. I would have to flesh out a policy because obviously we don't want them to interfere with an active investigation. So there has to be a little give and take, and certainly we should explore that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. You mentioned all the city council members are different people and have different Mm -hmm. perspectives. And I've been kind of surprised that you've encountered animosity from Barbara Bree, especially a city council member. And she's running for mayor now. And she's she's talked about it a lot about how inadequate she feels you are and um, and and some rather poignant criticism. And then you took the step of actually endorsing Todd Gloria the uh, her arrival for the job. Mm-hmm. What is your understanding of the political role that you now have as a, as an elected city leader? Um, I remember again some of the precedent that you know you weren't interested in maybe being a, a political leader. Yes, and and that's a very those are very political situations you find yourself in. Now to be clear, I don't think political is a pejorative. I I think it's better than, you know, we should solve shared uh, power in this country in politics rather than war <laughs> yeah. or, or other sorts of, you know, force mechanisms. So politics is good. But it is an interesting position for you to be in and one that, you know, has been uncomfortable for some of your predecessors to talk about. So why did you endorse Todd and, and what's your role as a political leader? Yeah, that was that took a great deal of soul searching to figure out if I would endorse at all in that race. And I have not endorsed in council races and I don't expect to do that. But what I have found during the course of my little over three years is the mayor is a key partner in getting things done. And I think there is such an opportunity with the right mayor to move the city ahead. And I would never put myself in such a stressful 24 hour a day um, position if I didn't think I could do that. So the opportunity that lies there with somebody who is a proven leader. And I, I was working with Todd when he was a city council member because I joined the city back in 2009. And during his months as interim mayor, I was a chief deputy. I have never worked so hard in my life as a chief deputy as when Todd was interim mayor. I mean, climate action plan, living wage ordinance, he just, he really got it done. And I think we are starved for that at the city. And I'm very excited about the potential to work with somebody who has a proven reputation of working well with others, uh, collaborating, having um, a vision and succeeding at getting it done. So I thought, For the last term, I really want to be able to work with that partner. And I I put myself out there and I I got beat up for it. I realize that. But I also think that the public wants to know what I think on certain issues. And I get asked all the time about who I'd love to see as mayor. And he was always a person that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. So I felt like a fraud keeping it inside when those questions were being asked. Interesting. You said City Hall is starved for that. Is the mayor not providing that kind of aggressive leadership? 
the mayor and I are very different people, and he has been a fabulous supporter on some of my priority projects, like criminal justice reform. I couldn't ask for a better partner. Uh, the Family Justice Center, that had been under the supervision of the police department, and I came to the mayor and I said, look, I, I think I could do a lot with it, and protecting victims of domestic violence is a priority. I'd love to expand that to human trafficking. He was 100% on board. He's been He's been a great partner, but I think that that is a decision that – the taxpayers at some point need to make about what they think, what they thought of his tenure. Um, from my perspective, he's been very helpful to me when I need him. Hmm. One of the things you do that, as you mentioned, is different than like the county council is you do prosecute misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. The, the DA handles all misdemeanors for the county, except in the city of San Diego. And one of the major discussions we have about misdemeanors right now is the role of law enforcement on the streets dealing with homelessness. So there's actual homeless-specific encounters that that happen, whether they're blocking sidewalks, they're camping illegally, that sort of thing. And then there's the actual encounters about drugs and alcohol or Mm -hmm. other problems that that are occurring within some of the encampments and stuff like that. What is your opinion of the proper role of law enforcement in, in encountering and dealing with the homeless crisis? And I see myself as part of the law enforcement family. And when a big part of what we do is prosecutions in our office, we get about 20,000 criminal cases presented to us for prosecution every year, plus the domestic violence cases that we review. And I, I see us as the introduction to perhaps the criminal justice system and an opportunity for us to help people get out of it. And a lot of the people we encounter have ended up committing crimes because they have some kind of an underlying issue. They're, they're addicted to alcohol or drugs, and they might steal so that they can feed their habit. Those are the pe- I, mean, I think we've all grown up in families where we've been exposed to some kind of an alcohol or drug abuse. And I, I grew up with that, so I certainly have a lot of compassion for people who are struggling. And it impacts families. It impacts a child's ability to go to school. And I take it very seriously. So what we have tried to do is create uh, mechanisms in the office to help these people not continue down that path. Um, And one example is our San Diego Diego Misdemeanor at Risk Track Program. And what we do is we identify people who have drug abuse issues, who have committed crimes, who are ready for change. They've ended up homeless as a result, and they need a bed because we have to pull them out of what they were living in or they're going to go right back to it. So we bought a – it's been super successful, and it started with Jan Goldsmith. It was his idea. I was the person who got to implement it. So we use independent living facilities throughout San Diego. We rent the bed. We get them the services. And we thought it makes so much more sense just to buy a hotel, which we did. And we've completely restored it so that we have 81 beds so we can house these folks. And my competitor sued us to prevent us from opening this facility that would help so many people get out of the criminal justice system. Um, And that is just absolutely heartbreaking. And yesterday we finally got the decision. Well, I shouldn't say finally because we argued it last week, turned it around in a week from the appellate court saying, you are good to go. You can open your facility. This is exactly the kind of thing that I want to see us doing more often because A lot of these folks have just fallen by the wayside, and we can help them get back into society again. So in answer to your question, I think we need to do everything we can as a government to help these folks get back on their feet. And there's some people that we can't. And then I also have no tolerance for certain areas. Right. But there is a more and more vocal group of people in the in San Diego who are very concerned about what they call the criminalization of homelessness. Yes. Yeah, our police and in some cases your office going overboard with the ticketing and sort of the enforcement mechanisms that make being poor that poor even harder. And I've heard that argument before, but before an officer is going to um, to charge somebody, make that decision, all of these contacts occur to try to make sure that they have access to a bed. And we're required to do that because we have a couple of settlements that – dictate how we how we address homelessness in the city of San Diego. So we give a lot of options before we ever get to that step, and we look for that. In fact, we'll reject a case if we don't see evidence that the officer has made all of those attempts to get somebody a bed. 
we have more lots than ever right now because a lot of folks are living in their cars and we want to make sure they're in a safe place where they're not going to be hassled. Can we improve? Absolutely. I think this is a national discussion and San Diego is not the only one that's struggling with it. I am always willing to look at pilots. I'm always willing to fail so long as we can try to try to find a resolution that is going to make our communities feel safe and healthy, but also try to help these people get back on their feet. It is, it is a very difficult situation. I think we've had some success, and I feel optimistic about it. Okay, last question. Um, AB5, this is mm-hmm. the law that um, and, and came out of a decision called Dynamex that says that if you provide a service for a company that is like what an employee would do for that company, a baker at a bakery, you have to be an employee. You have sued um, Instacart, the provider of grocery delivery services, mm-hmm. and uh, I think have pursued a, a temporary restraining order that could actually shut the company down or or make it change dramatically how it operates. Uh, what makes a case like that become something that you want to uh, to do? That, that's a terrific question. So I have an affirmative civil enforcement unit in my office. And as a large city and an elected city attorney, I have a an opportunity to bring cases on behalf of the people of the state of California. I'm very cautious in my approach. So I look at the impact it's going to have on San Diego, directly on San Diego, not the nation or, you know, San Francisco or something like that. So with Instacart, we have about a million folks using the services. It actually is a pretty big employer here in San Diego. And we started to hear complaints from employees who were saying, our um, our job is so monitored by the company, we don't have freedom even to walk down particular aisles. They're telling us how to pick the groceries. We're not reimbursed for our gas or for the um, maintenance of our vehicles. If they are terminated, they don't have unemployment because the company doesn't pay into unemployment. If they're hurt on the job, they don't get workers' compensation because the company doesn't pay into the system. And there were some egregious cases. And individuals who are Instacart employees are not going to sue on their own. And and that's another thing I look for is, is there, are there a lot of people impacted? Is it such a small amount per individual that they probably will not seek recourse? And that's what we saw in Instacart. And some of the, the situations are heartbreaking. Our goal is to ensure that these people are being treated fairly and they are be, they're properly classified. I don't want to shut the company down. People like Instacart. Those who use it love the convenience of it. What we're asking for is fairness for the employees who are being impacted. And we've been very um, open with Instacart to say, let's let's talk about your business model. We can drop all this litigation. Tell us how we can fix your business model so these people are treated fairly. And we might get there because by all indications, the judge who heard the case said, hey, it looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. I think it's a duck. Mm-hmm. And he's he put into his order, you know, you're going to have to really think about your business model. And that's exactly what we want them to do. I'm, I'm looking at particular cases, not an industry. All right, Elliot, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for listening to the Voice of San Diego podcast bonus episode. You can keep up with all the coverage at The Morning Report. That's our most popular product. You can get it at vost.org slash morning. I'm Scott Lewis, the CEO and Editor-in-Chief. This show is produced by Nate John, Megan Wood, and Adriana Heldes, and it's recorded in the Voice of San Diego podcast studio, which is made possible by the sponsorship of the Bob Nelson Charitable Fund. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening.